Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Human Humane Architecture here on Think Tech Hawaii. I am this program's co-host, Soto Brown, and speaking to us from Germany, where he currently is, is the host of our program, Martin Despang. Martin, are you there? Say hello to us. I am. Welcome back to Soto, and welcome, everyone. And uh, to be back together. So what are we going to talk about today, Martin? Pretty much along the lines of last show where we take advantage of being transcontinentally all over the place and reflecting on our island architecture, which we did. This is picture at the top right. Oh, wait, no, we're not there yet. Year. We're not there yet. Just behind we're, we're me. Not there yet. We're not there yet. We, we, just, will. we just have the Pan Am building behind me. All Pardon right, me for well. not letting you know that. And now we can go to our first picture. <laughs> and now Martin can that describe it. And that was stealing the show. And we had a couple of glitches today, technology. Yes, that's you know, we got to talk half around the world. So it's a miracle that we can do this anyway, as we said, as it is a miracle that we can fly around the world, which right. we will talk about today again. That's right. And so aviation architecture has been a vehicle for reflection on what we're doing architecturally. And last show, we had the TWA building reminding us of the good old Blaisdell Center that you and I are increasingly sort of curious or worried about what they're going to do to That's the good right. old exhibit hall, which they're going right. to tear down and replace. And you just walk by some um, illustrations about the new one, and you told me you're not sure about the thing, right? Correct. So anyway, so here's, and, our, um, here's our first picture, and we've got Tom Cruise on the left. And then we've, yeah. got, we've got Martin on the far right. No, we've got DeSoto on the far right right at the moment. And yeah, we're and talking about, and, and you said that Tom Cruise in this film, this of course is the German DVD cover, is a TWA mm -hmm. pilot. But we're not talking about TWA today. We're talking about Pan American World Air Rays. And in the picture, mm -hmm. in addition to Tom Cruise, there's a picture of DeSoto Brown as he looks today. And then there's a picture of DeSoto Brown as he looked back in the 1960s, down at the bottom of the picture. He's, he he always looked the same, DeSoto. He uh, always looked the same. I think he looks a little, <laughs> I didn't have a beard back in the 1960s. But in any case, next to me are some Pan Am bags. And back in the 60s, if you were a local nerd, you carried a Pan Am bag to school with your books in it. And I was friends with the nerds who carried the Pan Am bags. They tried to get me to carry one. I said, I just can't go that far. So I intentionally ripped it and then said, oh, sorry, I can't carry my Pan Am bag anymore. But it Thanks for sharing that, that traumatized <laughs> experience. That's right. And if you could... If, if you could see me live, which we weren't able to do because of technology reasons, you would see uh, what's here under the uh, uh, chin of Tom Cruise is the Tiki Lounge, where I was yeah. supposed to report from, yeah. which is in the basement of my best friend, Stefan and Kirsten. And we had reported about that about a year ago when I was coming back, and that was with Suzanne and her Tropical Tourism show. So all our thoughts are, you know, still with the island, and you will travel. That's the picture at the middle on the right. You will go to the Tiki Oasis, which is the World Conference on Tiki. That's right. And so we will report on that. And again, as you pointed out, I was traveling um, and, and had this DVD, and TWA was sort of the theme. And next picture, please, is there's another airline that I've been using, being German. I'm using Lufthansa, and these are the pictures on the very right. And this is a very vintage, you know, um, uh, German um, air company, of course, and they were rather, you know, ahead of the game and, and leading back in the days as they still are. There was a ranking recently that we looked at the, the top 20 of air uh, carriers, and uh, this one made it to number seven. Unfortunately for us, the American side of us, is that no American company made it on that list anymore, right? Correct. But that was different way back with this other airline, uh, which is Pan Am. And right. this is another DVD cover here. This is the German version. Again, it says the Komplette Serie, which means the Komplette Series. 
And this is Pan Am, and I think this was running rather recently, like until 2011 or so, right? And, and, and I want to point out in these two pictures that one of the things that's really being shown off here is the swinging stewardesses, because stewardesses mm -hmm. in those days had to be young, they had to be attractive, and they were thought of as sexually available, and if not, they were certainly attractive to men who were flying <laughs> on airplanes. So that was a whole mystique back in those days of stewardesses. Yeah. But yeah, that's not so true. It was, it was a total piece of artwork. It was branded. And we get to the next picture. Pan Am was hiring artists who were doing pretty magnificent sort of posters. Yep. Sort of, and this is one, you know, I could have been flow, flying with uh, that uh, company, Pan Am, to Germany. Here you can see Neuschwanstein or some kind of uh, artist interpretation of that. But uh, let's do the next picture. And you're gracious enough, although we want to mainly promote uh, one museum, which is your museum, the Bishop Museum, where you're generous enough to also support other museums. Yes. And the Pearl Harbor um, uh, Museum has an aviation part. And these are uh, some pictures I took, you know, pretty soon after I arrived on the island about like half a decade ago. I went there, and these are pictures that I took that they have a booth that's dedicated to Pen Am back in the days. And let's go to the next picture, which actually shows how it all started. And tell us a little about that. Yeah, and so. the point about Pan American that's really important for the Hawaiian Islands is that it was the first commercial airline to fly here starting in 1936. And at that time, this was absolutely the leading cutting edge of technology that planes were able to fly that far from the west coast of North America to the Hawaiian Islands. That was the max that any airplane could fly. They started out with um, Martin aircraft, and then they shifted to Boeing. And in the picture that we see here, this is a very fantasy view of one of those Boeing Clipper planes, Pan American planes. They really were not as huge as this, but the, uh, it was a very romantic and exciting thing to do to fly all the way to the Hawaiian Islands. It took 17, 18, 19 hours, which sounds preposterous, but that was much, much less than four to five days, which is what it took on a ship. And if we go to the and next picture, um, we and can- And that's where you see that at the top right, you can see the old ships in the back in the days, and you see that clipper, right. which is the name of the airplane. You yeah. can see, illustrate what you were talking about at the picture, the picture bottom left, which I found online, you told me you know that little girl there, right? Absolutely, she was a good friend of my parents, and her name was Patricia Scott. Uh, Patricia Kennedy Scott, she dedicated the Hawaii Clipper at uh, Pan American Plain at Pearl Harbor in 1936, and she poured coconut milk over the prow of the aircraft and said, I christen you the Hawaii Clipper. And so, as, mm -hmm. as you were saying, too, if you look at the cutaway views of this, the Clipper planes were huge inside, and because you were paying a premium price, you could walk around, there were berths, there were other different types of compartments, and I think in the next picture we're going to see some of the exactly. interior detailing, and there we are. And mm -hmm. uh, that, was, uh, that was an event, right? It was rather exclusive for oh, the yes. rich, and yes. they were able to roam around. They had a lot of leg room, as they call it today. People weren't squeezed like sardines into a a tin can like these days, right? This Absolutely. was luxurious, this was flamboyant, as you can see in these pictures. And the next uh, page is going to be, again, pictures I took from the exhibit at Pearl Harbor. Uh, this is the next generation of plane, and this is the Stratocruiser. And that one was flying, you know, between, I think, the mid-30s and the 50s. No, actually, that it was, was the next level. Yeah, that's post-war. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, the Stratocruiser actually, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah this, is, this is a development of technology that was created during World War II. And the Stratocruiser, like the previous plane that we saw, had two levels. And you could walk from mm -hmm. the upper level down to the lower level to go to a little cocktail lounge down there. And... Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's something you certainly can't do were, in planes. Yeah, and you were saying, you know, from today's point of view, you know, I mean, way back there was cutting edge, state of the art, but compared to these days, there was still pretty bumpy rides. Some of them came down and never, you know, yeah. made it. So it was, it was pioneering. Yes. And then it was sort of uh, replaced by the next uh, phase, which gets us to the next picture, which is the jet age. Yes. And here you can see, again, a very sort of stylish, um, you know, poster from Pan Am sort of branding that and communicating that. And you can see Honolulu, which is our city, and you can see people, 
you know, pretty much dressed internationally. That doesn't look very easy breezy to me. No, it's so not. So we're not talking about fetishizing the tiki aspect of the islands. We're talking about a metropolis to yes. be. And uh, yes. the, the roll of pictures on the right side is uh, my privileged view, which uh, a couple of shows ago we were talking about the Waikiki Grand in my view and Diamond Head. So just jump to the next page. And that one and the following one are dwelling upon that most iconic view of Diamond Head, yes. which uh, Pan Am was using for its marketing. Right? Correct, correct. And those are both 1950s. Uh, the, the left one on the left is actually a poster from the Jet Age. It says by Jet Clipper at the top. And the ad mm -hmm. on the right is from the early 1950s. All that's missing in Hawaii is you. So just as Martin said, they're using the iconic outline of Diamond Head to help sell Pan American World Airways trips to the Hawaiian Islands. And so it is on the next page, which again, thanks for providing these from your archives. So this yeah. is once again, just variations of that. Yes. And let's jump to the next picture here, which is uh, referring to the last show we did here. So here's the, the jet plane and it's sort of Aloha and you can see people still walking up to the plane, as we said, yeah. it's different to today. Getting to the next page, yes. Where we said, where we're concluding last show, we were saying when you were able to open the, the door of the airplane, immediately the, the full senses, uh, you know, were 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 attracted uh, and stimulated, and especially the one of smell, and where it's graphically shown here that you know the diamond head once again is sort of framed by flowers. But these flowers weren't just pretty to look at. These flowers were even more pretty to smell. And yeah. so, again, as this picture you provide on the right side, you've got the lake, you've got the sun, you've got the tropical scent. So that was the whole deal, the whole experience. That was so different than, than any of the other places where Pan Am was flying yes. within the United States, yes. right? Yes, absolutely. And, one but, of the, and, and because this is before jetways existed, you were immediately exposed to the outside air. And as we were talking about earlier, the trade winds. And you can see the people in the picture yeah. are being blown by the trade winds, which is part of the entire mm -hmm. ambience of your mm -hmm. arrival in the tropical paradise of Hawaii. Mm -hmm. yeah. And all of that, and that's the next picture you were saying was was quite the undertaking to manage this all from technology to organization to logistics was quite the thing yes. back in the days and still is. And this is portrayed by this sort of classic picture with the uh, the Boeing in front of the terminal building. And you can see the crew there. You yeah. know, th this is symbolic for, okay, we're... We're serious. This is business. This is professional, right? Absolutely. And it is comfortable, and it is professional, and it's safe, and it's modern. Because we are using the most mm -hmm. modern planes with trained technical people. And with a modern Honolulu International Airport behind it, what else could you ask for on your trip to paradise? Exactly. And talking paradise and being uh, professional and modern, get, let's get to the next page. These are my favorite of your posters you provided here because they're not they're not nostalgic, they're not tiki, they're not sort of pre-contact. Uh, they're, they're showing Hawaii in its modern way, yes. rooted in tradition. This is very fine artwork. This is, again, Pan Am was a uh, total piece of artwork. Back then, getting us to the next page, where this is funny postcard. Tell me why you found this so funny. Uh, yeah, well, let's go to the next picture. And uh, there, well, this is a, it, it looks like it's a real image of a Pan Am plane flying over the east end of Oahu. And if you look at it more closely, you can see that none of that is really very real at all. Hawaii Kai is not look, does not look like that. There's no Hanama Bay, et cetera. So it's really an artist's conception. But what it does show mm -hmm. is that the jet age, which started in 1959, really led to a tremendous amount of growth in the Hawaiian Islands, particularly in Honolulu. So the jet flying over the fantasy view is still getting across the idea that real changes were happening because of this new mm -hmm. type of technology. Yeah. They were even sort of fetishizing the urban sprawl where the yeah. neighborhoods go up into the mountains, yeah. which is sort of, you wouldn't do it that bad. You're sort of more worried about that these days, where back in the day, sort of, no, correct. you know, being dynamic and being sort of emerging was a positive thing. It wasn't seen as problematic as it is these days. Absolutely. And talking problematic, getting us to the next page, this is in the last show where we're talking about that some fine pieces of architecture. And at this point, this is sort of the audience might say, when, what does it all have to do with architecture? Correct. So now we're talking 
So uh, at JFK, where you were, you know, you were closed last time, they, we said the uh, fine piece of our island architect, I am Pei, who did the East West Center, is not anymore. And TWA's most sort of iconic yeah. building was this one here, which was called the World Port, that was also at JFK. And it was built in 1961, very iconic building that very sadly was torn down not that many years ago, I think like five years ago. And this is sort of tragic. And if you look at that building, it's sort of a perfect uh, symbol for the sort of, you know, positive, optimistic era of the Jets. And yeah. you can probably see the roof being inspired by the long span of the wings. And, and look at that span and look at that iconic sort of uh, technology and, 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 and tectonics. And sad that, that, that this piece is not around anymore. But the piece that probably most people in the world associate that architectural piece with Pen M, we see on the next picture, and you stopped by on your recent trip to New York. Yes, I stayed right. right near it. In fact, I took the picture in the upper right corner, and the Pan Am building in New York City was very iconic when it was constructed, which is about 1960. Unfortunately, because there is no Pan American Airways anymore, it's no longer called that. It's called the MetLife building. But in the picture, you can see mm -hmm. that Grand Central Station is at the base with this other iconic building up above it. Now, one of the things we talked about also was that when this building was built, for a brief time period, there was an, a helicopter shuttle that could take you from this mm -hmm. high rise to JFK Airport, which it didn't work mm -hmm. out very well for a number of reasons. And there was, in fact, unfortunately, a disastrous uh, crash of one of the helicopters, which is one of the reasons they stopped doing it. But when they did do it, it was, again, an absolute symbol of the most modern way you could travel on this iconic airline that flew all around the world and was really a symbol of the United States internationally at the time that this was going on. Absolutely. And talking international, the architect was an international consortium of what we represent, Germans and Americans. There was Mr. Delucci and there was Mr. Walter Gropius. So again, very iconic building, very iconic architect. And uh, so next picture is us, because if you do more research, you see what kind of, you know, um, Pan Am architecture is there around in the world. And there's only one other building. And we have that building, and this is the Pan Am building. And so at the very top, you can see the iconic original sign that is still so hip and so cool as, you know, you know, communicated through the TV series. And, you know, honestly, and I didn't want to reactivate your trauma with the bags. Luckily, you told me, because I said at some point, let's get a T-shirt with Pan Am, which they're selling <laughs> in that airport shop. And you said, then you shared your trauma with me and said, maybe, maybe not. So maybe anyway, not. So maybe Pan Am not. is still, even though the, the company is gone, is long gone, right? Yes. They're still making money off the memory, yep, right? They are. And, uh, and our building here still has the, uh, you know, iconic sign, even though, you know, there's no business in there anymore, as, as you can tell. And architecturally, at the very top left, we featured this briefly already in our introduction to tropical brutalism, because we believe it's a fine piece. And the picture on the top right is introducing your next show in two weeks, which is about the sort of increasing insignificance of the uh, Magnificent Mile at Cavalliani Boulevard. Right, that's so, right. So uh, let's jump to the next page and look at the building a little closer. And uh, we, we once again, we choose this, you know, poster that you provided, which is about the lure of the exotic and mm -hmm. the erotic in that mm -hmm. case here. That's right. And be, you know, appropriately dressed, which people would say is inappropriate, we would think it's appropriate because you don't, shouldn't wear it much because yeah. then you're, you're getting too hot. And this is something that the building does. The building is comprised of a plinth at the bottom and out of that rises the slick and slender tower and here you have an open lanai yes you got shade yes you got plans yes so what more do you want than the that's tropics, right that's right? right that's right that's right but it has an interesting texture so, too 
um, the exterior yeah, we get of the building. To that in a bit. Yes, I mean, uh -huh. but but, but not we, only we get to that. Yeah, not only we can go to the next picture. I, and when I say the interesting, it, the exterior of the building in general, in, in addition to the close-up views, if you look at this from a brutalist standpoint, you can see these two views of the building at different times of the day show how mm -hmm. the exterior, the the minimizing of the glass areas and the vertical fins as well as the other exterior parts of the building help shade it. But you also were talking about the heat content and the, the what the what concrete yeah. does when it gets heated, and that's another consideration right here. Well let's go to the next page for that. I'm glad you mentioned that because we yet have to, you know, do more research on that thermal mass problem because if you minimize the glass you know, you keep the sun out and the heat, but the sun is also gonna hit the concrete. So today you can do uh, ultra-light concrete, which is sort of micro-infused with R value. Back in the days, not so much. But in general, we can say the approach is sort of tropic, is exotic. And let's go to the next page where I, you know, I have another uh, very, one of my favorite pictures of branding uh, Pan Am Hawaii here with that local lady here. Yeah. And that made us think about, about surface, about yeah, texture, go to the next about picture. pigment. There. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and, here and, we can see right. that. Well, and what? so I, you know, maybe, maybe it's a little bit of a stretch, but let's, let's just think about surface and pigment right. and skin. Right. And her skin is naturally pigmented to, you know, withstand the, the UV of the sun better when right. you dark. And here, the, the building is doing that too. You can see the aggregates are local. This is basalt, there's coral in there. There's maybe some kind of brown pigment. Right. So again, it's, right. it's about, it's a, it's a surface that is sort of locally appropriate, right? Correct. And we have these two pictures in there, which are, which is our uh, uh, friends and collaborators from Great Pacific Rocky Mountain Precast, Adam and Les Campers, and there it shows if you want to know more about you know, why concrete is such an, it's continued to be such a sort of uh, pioneering material on the island, you can watch these shows. We, you know, we're gonna get close to the end, so. Oh, uh, you know what, before, you, before we go, I just wanted to say too, that as you said, that mix of materials adds a lot of interest to the close-up view of the building that a lot of other buildings that are just plain concrete or concrete block would not have. And that's a kind of a touch mm -hmm. that is more thoughtful and more artistic than sometimes is done for commercial buildings. Anyway, that's just me. Absolutely. Let's go to the, let's go to the next picture. No. And yeah, so we're, we're phasing out and we're talking about, you know, okay, when, uh, you know, in the bigger picture, I think 2045, we want to be off the grid and 100% right. renewable energy. So airplanes right. and big ships, you know, cruise ships, and I think we're going to do a show, we've planned this for a while, we want to call them horizontal high rises yeah. because they appear in downtown every now and then. And they're the biggest gases and, and emission creators ever. So that industry is looking into, you mentioned the trade winds again, because people not from the island, when we abbreviate and say the trades are back, people yeah. think the stock market is back up. No. But in fact, it's the wind that blows predominantly from the northeast. And the early people coming set their sails somewhere in Seattle and, and sail straight down. So that industry of, of shipping, uh, uh, you know, a cruise ship uh, industry is looking back into into wind as to power them. So let's go to the next picture. But when you go when you go big, when you think big, and this is one of our urban studies here, jungleism, which we pointed out in these couple of shows up there, and and you basically start to make the city a city, which our point is, it isn't to the extent it should be. And you really densify and learn from nature and, and create a bioclimatic right. building code. Then, next picture, you end up with what is that? What do you end up with then on the other side, on the countryside? Well, the what, country, country. what we talked about too in, in the Primitiva buildings are mostly open. They are open to the, they don't use as much fossil fuel because they get a lot of their energy, they, they reduce their energy use by using trade winds, by using natural ventilation. And they also are allowing people to move around more, they're allowing people to congregate, they're allowing people to be by themselves. And because the building is not very dense itself, it kind of fades into the background more than a solid block of a building does. So this is kind of a yeah. fantasy view of what could be if we were to adopt some of these other types of procedures rather than just going with everything that we have already been doing. 
Exactly. So here's the contrast that we're going to chart, and we're not going to do what, you know, the the sort of the the sort of uh, you said the artist rendering of that sort of more naive. Um, yeah. postcard of Pan Am, where they were proudly presenting, we're going to grow up the hills. Now you're going to say, we're not going to do that anymore. We're not going to sprawl. We basically densify the city, what's the previous picture, in order to basically free the country to do what we should do, what we've been doing all the back in the days, which is growing food and keep the country country, that sort of local right. term. Right. And then every once in a while, a primitiva building can sort of be very efficient and effective in being tall and stacking, Kurt Sandburn calls it stack one nine. Right. So you can grow food again, which we could do, but we can also grow something else, and this is, gets us to the very last yeah. picture, Yeah. because the industry is doing R&D, research and development, and just like BP is the biggest uh, researcher in TV and solar, because when it comes to the point that they run out of oil, they want to just flip the switch and basically still stay in business and yeah. be uh, on top of the game. Exactly. So the airplane industries are doing that as well. And I was listening to a documentary on the radio while driving in southern Germany in the Alps, in the foothills of the Alps, and I was intrigued by that they were saying they can power airplanes by by um, by algae. So you grow algae and you create distill, you know, fuel out of it. And here we go. This is our vision that you basically can then bring back the many tourists. And we have a growing amount of tourists coming every year. It's going to be more. So how do we bring them back if we do it with kerosene? You know, this is part of our what we do. And so we're probably not going to need 2045 being off the grid, but maybe with this technology. So this is our vision into the next, you know, future. And which is a fascinating one. And when you come down to it, everything comes down to the sun. The sun gives energy to the earth and how we use that energy, either it's fossil fuels or it's fuels that are being created right now. They serve the same function, but fuel we're creating now can be renewable rather than used once and then gone forever. And that's one of the things mm -hmm. that, that is going to make travel possible. So if we're talking about the good old days of airplanes that just use fuel, we got to think ahead to the good new days of airplanes that will use a different kind of fuel, and that's what these pictures are. And uh, that brings yeah, us to the end of our show. Um, and we'll, I'll be back okay. next week. I think Martin Martin is going to be off well, next week. Uh, Martin's will be. Well, you you will be back. Yes, you I will. will. Be actually, back in two weeks because oh, two weeks, we're on our two week schedule. And right. next week is going to be our esteemed uh, Docomomo board. That's right. Uh, member uh, with another fascinating show, and you will be back and week sharing after your that. worries and and hopes. Hopes yes. about the tropical yes. exotic, hopefully still in the future, Capulani Boulevard, right? That's exactly right. And so thank you, Martin, for being here. Thank me for being here. Uh, Dokomomo will be back next week on Human Humane Architecture. I'll be back a week after that. And until that time, everybody, thanks for watching. Aloha.